Energy in America here on Think Tech on a given Wednesday with Lou Pudirisi, who is the president of EPRINC, the Energy Policy Research Foundation in Washington, D.C. And he joins us from Washington, D.C. And we want to talk about policy. The operative word is policy always. And we here in Hawaii need to know what's going on in the rest of America. And Lou can help us. The title of our show is The Green New Deal and The Green Real Deal. Uh, devised by Ernest Muniz, who was the energy secretary uh, under Obama. Uh, very important yeah. that he should speak up on the subject. And, and now we have two hands clapping. We have AOC <laughs> and the Green New Deal. We have, we have Ernest Muniz and the Green Real Deal. And I guess what that's saying is it's real rather than you know, <laughs> hypothetical. <laughs> so tell us more about it, will you, Lou? Yeah, so I thought we would talk about, of course, we, I think we did discuss a few weeks ago that when, um, you know, Ms. Uh, Cortez, uh, the uh, congressman from uh, Brooklyn or Queens up there in New York City, uh, proposed this uh, rather uh, extraordinary policy shift in the United States uh, with Senator Markey from Massachusetts, that it received a great deal of criticism, but it also receives a great deal of support among many younger members of the Democratic Caucus on Capitol Hill. And one of the interesting things about it is that I think when you go through it, you see how unrealistic it is. But I thought was interesting is that Ernie Moniz, the former Secretary of Energy, ha has been working diligently on something called uh, the Green Real Deal, which is uh, part of something called the Energy Futures Initiative. And what I'd like to do is talk about what, what's in that deal as opposed to the, the new Green Deal, the Green New Deal, and why even Ernie's uh, idea and proposal represents a very, very heavy lift and a few items he has not had a chance to confront directly, which I think it represents a, an enormous obstacle, something that we're going to have to think about and deal with as we proceed. Uh -huh. And as always, we're going to show a few numbers because, you know, people don't like numbers in Washington because they make some of their ideas look silly. So <laughs> we, like to show them. we like to show the numbers anyway. Okay. <laughs> Oh, and you have some you have so, some charts that will help explain this. Yeah, so let yeah, so I do have some charts that will help explain it, and so let's maybe we should begin. Okay, so the first one is a kind of you can see in the background. Uh, Ernie Moniz has a kind of George Washington Benjamin Franklin haircut. It's I don't know exactly why he does that, <laughs> but he, it's his a distinctive <laughs> his a distinctive uh, uh, characteristic of him. People can recognize him easily. And, uh, you know, his basic, I think his basic view is, look, you can't put together one of these projects to transform the American energy complex without dealing with a whole range of not just technical issues, but political issues, including coalition building, including addressing uh, workforce issues, addressing uh, the fact that some folks will be uh, left out of the mix or their traditional way of doing things will put them out of work. And you have to really kind of, you, do, you need enormous com commitment to do this. And I think that, that for that, you want to command Ernie. I mean, he's really tried to think this through instead of just using a bunch of talking points or buzzwords that'll get millennials excited and you know, then they'll forget to wake up on election day anyway. So, you know, that, so I think he's, he's sort of, you know, he's sort of gotten a more serious approach. Well, so let me, let me ask next, you this, Lou. Yeah. Um, you talk about, um, you know, political realities. Um, you talk about, um, you know, the, the pragmatism of uh, trying to get the program through Congress, which won't be easy in yeah. any event. Uh, yeah. And certainly the Green New Deal with AOC's Green New Deal will never get through the current Congress. It'll stop. 
uh, at the Senate for sure. But, um, but but I think you know, it won't get through the House. Okay, I mean no, yeah, no okay. rational politician is going to vote for something like eliminating air travel in ten years. There are people in Hawaii who might vote for that, and then after they vote, they might think they, oh, we just committed sapuka. Uh, nobody can fly here. So I, I do think that. Uh, <laughs> so I, I do think. If you want to do this stuff, you have to have a hard-headed discussion. I'll give Ernie credit for that. I well, you have to have, you have, ultimately, you have to have a, somebody in the White House who is interested in, in green deals of any kind. Uh, and if Donald yes. Trump stays president, neither of these programs has a chance. Am I right? Well, yeah, I would, I would argue not only does neither have a chance, even if he is not president, even if Joe Biden is president, uh, many aspects of even Ernie's ideas will be difficult to achieve. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm not saying they can't be achieved, but I'm going to tell you why okay. during the discussion. Okay. So we go to the next one. I think this is what's interesting, the next chart, which is essentially this is the energy futures initiative. That's kind of a, you know, a very clever chart that shows all the things you need to do if you're really serious about this issue. And it, this, uh, and I was very struck by this, that he's, you know, they've thought through a lot of things. For example, if you go to the left-hand side there, carbon pricing, right? You need, uh, you need to put a price on carbon if you want people to use less of it. Then as you move up an innovation portfolio, this is kind of the Bill Gates, the Bill Gates idea of, look, you're going to beat this thing with technology. You're not going to be able to do it with a command and control approach, right? Uh -huh. You may, maybe even carbon price. You need new technologies. Uh -huh. You have to deploy an energy system which is cheaper than what we have now. Otherwise, you know, or close to what we have now. Otherwise, society is not going to, you know, the public is not going to accept an energy complex which is three or four times more expensive than what uh -huh. we have now. It's just uh -huh. not going to happen. Mm -hmm. You need to have very sustainable and secure supply chains. You know, people have to believe that this energy is secure. L large carbon scale management. This is to collect the carbon and store it somewhere underground. You need a workforce, right? You need a workforce that knows how to repair solar panels and build wind and uh, develop these new materials. You need an infrastructure that can withstand shifts in the climate, you know, whether it's sea rise or more severe storms, whether you believe that equitable, equitable transitions. You can't just tell, uh, you know, the United States now is the largest producer of oil and gas in the world. With our uh, North American uh, petroleum partners in uh, Mexico and Canada, we are net exporters to the world market of almost 400,000 barrels a day. It's worth a trillion dollars. It's a force of security for the world oil market. You are not going to remove that production in any political sense in a short period of time. Uh -huh. You're going to have to find a way to make it cleaner, to make it less carbon intensive. But the notion that you politically could tell the state of Texas, oh, by the way, uh, I think everyone should just go home tomorrow because we're not going to produce any more oil and gas. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. So I, I just don't understand where people are so unrealistic about these things. Well, does Ernest so Moniz think, say, does he say how long he thinks it's going to take to transition under his plan? I think, um, I don't remember the exact number, but it is a plan really to get on the gradient, to get on the curve it's going to take 30 to 40 years, right? It's going to take a long time. Mm -hmm. And I think even Ernie would agree with that, you know. And it takes a real political commitment even to do his. And at least his has got, you know, a basis on, you know, a lot of thought on social equity and, uh, you know, these, uh, all the kinds of things you need to do to make these things happen. So yeah, let I, me add I, one I, other point though, yeah, and that is, it yeah. goes back to the president. Uh, so we may not have the same president for two terms in a row or three terms in a row anyway. Um, and people may change their minds. And if they are inconvenienced or it's costing them too much uh, to follow uh, Ernie's plan or any plan, they're going to change their minds. They're going to change their president. And uh, 30 or 40 years could see all kinds of changes. 
in the way we look at this, and it may fail with right, right. a lack of consistency. You know, very easily, if something does not make sense in, 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 the, in, in terms of uh, it's sustainable as an economic model, if it doesn't make sense, it will not last. You know, we spent, people forget, we had something called the Sin Fuels Corporation in the 70s. And the joke was it was always $5 a barrel more expensive than the price of oil. And we spent billions of dollars on that, billions of dollars. But it was not economic. And eventually we gave up. Uh -huh. uh, methyl hydrate. I can just go through. You know, the landscape is littered with these government projects, which did not have an economically sustainable basis to uh, make them last very long. So that, that is actually the real problem. And, and uh, one of the things I think we don't, we also need to kind of incorporate into our models is, you know, a clear understanding that just because I pick wind or solar and it has one dimension, that is, it produces energy with a low carbon footprint after it's constructed, it doesn't mean that deploying that technology is free, either in terms of capital, but also in terms of carbon. For example, right, uh, the International Renewable Energy Agency calculates that the solar goals for 2050, right, considers, consistent with the Paris Accords now, you know, this is the agreement that Trump pulled out of, but that, uh, that it will result in a, a disposal of old solar panels more than double the tonnage of today's global plastic waste, right? Mm. A single car battery, a single car battery, right, weighs about a thousand pounds. Fabricating it is going to require digging up, moving and processing more than 500,000 pounds of raw materials. Right. So I, I think no one talks about this, but this is really important. Uh, Building one wind turbine, just one wind turbine, right, requires uh, 900 tons of steel, 2,500 tons of concrete, and 45 tons of non-recyclable plastic, right? Solar power requires even more cement and glass, not to mention other metals. So you're going to have a huge jump in mining and uh, earth removal, and much of this development's going to take place in parts of the world, in Africa and Latin America and parts of the world, in which we, they don't have good attention to uh, sensible environmental practices, where they exploit child labor. So I, I think that you know, all of these things are going to have to be addressed if we want to radically transform the economy. And no one's talking about that. So uh, no to tell us, compare the two programs. Uh, what is what is uh, AOC saying her program would be versus uh, so what is Ernest Monet saying? If you get to the next let, yes, so if you go to the next slide, you can see what AOC. You know, she th this is a very aspirational program, elimination of cows, subsidies for those unwilling to work. You know, she, they're wandering all over the map here. They're not even talking about uh, uh, you know alternative fuels so much, and. Uh, upgrading all existing buildings with energy efficient technology and doing this in a 10 year mobilization form. It is so ridiculous and that it's, and it's, it's such an easy issue to run against that really you need to discount it entirely. I mean, I don't even know why people are talking to this woman. She's a kind of idiot. Okay. Moniz is a more serious. I think the Moniz proposal is a serious, attempt and understanding that you have to build political coalitions, that you have to deal with the entire supply chain, and that you need a long-term sustainable commitment. Well, don't you, think, even, don't you think that AOC's, AOC's points, some of which are really you know, out there uh, and, yeah. and undoable, clearly, from every point of view, um, it's kind of a, you know, a barspiel. What I mean, it's a, it's a first offer, it's throwing it on the table, seeing how people react, seeing which points they like and don't like, uh, and letting Congress decide, you know, which, where is the statue in the marble 
uh, let's start carving possibly, kind of thing. And maybe even possibly. with her in her thinking, she wanted Moniz to come up uh, with some alternative. She wanted the conversation to start. What do you think about that possibility? Poss anything's possible in Washington, but I would say that uh, if you had the opportunity to watch the Democratic debates, I would uh, I would suggest that um, these things occur in a political environment. Yes. And if you're going to be rolling out these ideas and expect the opposition not to take them and beat you over the head with them, it's sort of naive. <laughs> so uh, so we're going to have Medicare for all. Well, <laughs> turns out not everybody is for Medicare for all. <laughs> Sounded like a good idea at the time, right? But, uh, <laughs> yeah. So I just think, you know, so the United States is a really big country. You know, it's uh, part of a massive, it is the largest economy in the world. And, you know, it's like, if you can imagine the largest air, aircraft carrier ever built by mankind, you're not going to turn it around. It's not going to corner <laughs> it's going to be have to be moved very slowly, a few degrees, one way or the other, uh -huh. and it has to be sustainable. Yeah. So my concern with the AOC thing is that, of course, it's ridiculous. But even Ernie's, I want you to understand that Muniz, who has a very thoughtful plan, right, a plan that makes, in many sense, if I were of that political bent or if I was really nervous about climate or I thought this was the only environmental issue to worry about, yeah, I could see that gaining traction over time, but it won't happen fast. Yeah. It's a long game to transform the national economy. And that's separate from the issue of whether it's a good idea. But of all the ideas out there, it's one of the better ones. Well, are the uh, candidates talking about it in debates? Uh, is anybody warming to it? Uh, we, we've seen well, newspaper articles and magazine articles, but... Is there any traction here? So I think there's a big disconnect between what the candidates say. I mean, do you really think Joe Biden or Trump know what they're talking about when they say, uh, it's, I'm, I'm, I don't care about uh, climate or I care about climate? I mean, I don't think they understand any of the details. And maybe that's not their job. Their job is to hire people who can kind of build a coalition to do that. So, yes. Biden says he's going to rejoin the Paris Accords. All the data we says it doesn't matter whether we're members of the Paris Accord or not. Okay. In fact, something that no one likes to talk about, but of all the countries in the world, for the last 12 years, the U.S. has the best performance in reducing its global emissions of uh, CO2. Okay. Now, I think you find that hard to believe, but that's what the Energy Information Agency data show. And although U.S. emissions went up a bit last year, over since, since 2000, or even going back, I think 95, we are the world leader in reducing emissions of CO2. And the reason for that is quite simple, natural gas. Uh -huh. Natural gas has driven out coal use in the U.S. And in fact, uh, if we go to the next chart, uh, you can see that. Um, and this one shows, well, let's start with this one. Here. This shows you that, you know, if you were to listen to all the newspaper reports and the, all the issues about the uh, emergence of renewable fuels, you can see here that after massive subsidies, right, massive subsidies, the U.S. now is producing about... 10% of its power generation. I'm not talking about total consumption in the national economy, just in the electric power sector. It's producing about 10% uh, from wind and solar. And you have to be careful when you look at this data because this data shows the actual power that was generated. You can read all this data that we have installed capacity in there. 30% in California, 40% here. But just because you have installed capacity doesn't mean you can deploy it. And that's the real issue, right? You can't deploy wind when it's not blowing or when the demand is not there. And that goes for solar as well. So here we are after spending all this money 
and I'm telling you, we have spent a ton of money. We are uh, still at about 10%. And probably uh, we've got hydropower of 7 or 8% more, which is an old technology in many ways, but is in any way you think about it, is a, is a renewable technology. You know, it strikes me looking at this chart, I know this is not where yeah. we're going here today, but yeah. uh, that the, on a national level, uh, the amount of wind is like four times the amount of solar. That is not, wind the, is, not a case at all yeah. in Hawaii. No, but it doesn't matter what happens in Hawaii. It's too small, okay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. Just observing, right? that's all. <laughs> It doesn't matter. I mean, I know people don't like to hear that, but uh, Hawaii is a beautiful place. It's a wonderful place, but in the global, st the global status, it's not important. That's why we power. need to talk to you, Lou. <laughs> <laughs> As I've said before, if you live in Hawaii and you're worried about climate, you should be worried about adaption. You're not going to, you're not going to save the world in Hawaii with water absolutely, or absolutely. solar power. <laughs> Okay. okay, you have another slide you want to show us. I do. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. All right. This is a different... So the last chart we talked about, uh, about uh, power generation, right? But when you look at, con when you look at the entire uh, energy mix in the U.S., and this is for, uh, you know, trains, trucks, transportation, petrochemicals, Everybody who uses wind, everybody who uses electricity in the U.S., you can see that um, the transportation sector is still, petroleum in the U.S. is largely in the transportation sector. And you can see that wind and solar is only about 4%. Mm -hmm. Maybe a little bit more in 2018, but when you take all the different uses of uh, power, of uh, energy, not just uh, not just in the utility sector, it's still a very small amount. And I think uh, that is something we really need to remember, that this is a big, big mountain to climb to get to sort of re replace all these traditional fuels. It can happen. And if you go back to the beginning of uh, the, you know, the, uh, let's say the modern age or even, you know, the, from 1500 on, as we have often said, there's really no instance of the world using less of any fuel, just new fuels come along. Mm -hmm. So the question is, for the US in which power, you know, the electric power sector only grows about 1% a year at the most. We really don't have, a, you know, our, our, our power generation is largely installed and growing slowly. This is a problem largely outside the U.S. Ah. And then the problem in the transportation sector is going to be a very, very difficult one. And uh, it's quite interesting, you know, the, uh, the amount of new minerals in, that we're going to need to sort of transform the entire automobile fleet to uh, battery powered uh, is, is, I think, it's such a big task that few people have talked about. What's, what it's going to take, and whether we're willing to tolerate the environmental damage from the mining and the development of new ores and rare earth materials, which, by the way, most rare earth minerals are neither rare uh, nor uh, it's short supply. They're just, uh, they require a very dirty and aggressive refining process, which is, is really unacceptable to most communities in the U.S. I'm, I'm, uh, I think it's complicated by the fact that not all these minerals and resources are available in the U.S. We have to import no, some, but, uh, including yes, from China. They, and, and China right, and, right. and the U.S. are in a trade war right now. So it becomes, uh, you know, uh, becomes questionable ex exactly how reliable that source is. Right, and we do have a big effort in the U.S. to look at, uh, and we do have a lot of rare earth minerals in the U.S. I want to point that we can mine them, New Mexico and Nevada and other parts of the U.S. But the question is, are we prepared to build the refining facilities? It's not just, it's not like you just like dig it up out of the earth and 
and you know, well, here's a gold nugget, just send it over to Tesla. It doesn't work like that. You've got to take these materials and then process them in a very elaborate process of treating them with uh, solvents and chemicals and uh, fabricating them. And it's quite, uh, it's going to be a quite extensive process. And, you know, this is this old joke that uh, the engineers, you know, if you talk to engineers, they say, look, one of these days, look, don't worry, we're going to find unobtainium. And I say, unobtainium, what is that? Okay, the unobtainium is the thing we don't have. Uh, a magical energy producing element that appears out of nowhere, requires no land, weighs nothing, and emits nothing. Everyone is looking for unobtainium, but we don't really have that, you know. So. But you know, but you know, there there will be new technologies. There'll be technologies there in, will in be, energy yes. and transportation. Right. There'll be new technologies in extracting it and processing it. And this could change, uh, you know, the, the, the course going forward, no? Right. And so my view is that, so it's not, look, you can't, I guess as a politician, you can't really sell this, but look. The right answer is to get on the gradient, right? Probably put a pay, put a price on carbon, and try to make progress along some curve where you can learn as you go along, where you are not completely disrupting the whole national economy or people's lives. First, because if you do that, people will rebel. We're still in democracy. People say, "No, I don't want to do that." Mm -hmm. So I think that that's. Uh, and uh, to get an idea, if we, let's see if we can go to the next, uh, the next picture here. Yeah, so here this shows you, so if we go to the next one, let's go to the next one here. I think this gives us a little better sense. Uh, okay, I think this is a very interesting chart. And this is from Ernie Moniz. And if you look around the country, you can see that, uh, for example, Arizona, Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, they have extremely low power costs, about 10 cents a kilowatt hour. And you compare that to the West with, at 16 cents. Now, probably that number is a little bit higher in California because Nevada has a lower, you know, lower costs. But, and per capita consumption in California is probably a little bit like Hawaii, they have good weather. You don't really have a high, you know, most of the people in California live on the coast, so they can pay a, a high amount per kilowatt hour, but uh, the actual cost per person is not that much. But what's interesting about all these is that as you, as you go with more, except for Hawaii, of course, but as you go with more uh, renewables, uh, your power costs rise. So one thing you have to be is honest with the American population. Say, well, yes, I realize the Sierra Club told you that wind and solar are free, but it turns out you have to like build these things and connect them to the grid and they don't work all the time. So it's not really free. It's going to cost you about a third more. Now, in the case of Hawaii, it's a unique problem because you don't have a uh, sort of traditional continental scale utility systems and you rely heavily on petroleum. But for the rest of the U.S., the evidence in the chart there from Ernie, and it's been around a long time, is that as you ram more renewables into the system, the price of electricity goes up. Well, that leaves us with have... a kind of interesting place because you have these yeah. two competing plans. Neither one of them is fully realistic. Um, right. and, and you don't have a national energy policy that, that is really popular among the people right now, and you don't have a debate that's going on that, 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 that shows you the way to the future of a national energy policy. Uh, without a national energy policy, um, you know, we're not going to be able to achieve a whole lot. So what, what do we do now? Uh, you have one minute so to answer, what, Luke. Okay, what we do is we continue to invest in R&D to look for... Uh, low cost and system wide costs that uh, help to that are acceptable, that have a good uh, ratio of economic benefits to cost. And we try to move in an opportunistic way along the gradient and, uh, and make a, a very careful assessment 
of what, what we put into adaption and what we put into uh, new technologies. And as uh, one of the Democratic candidates said, oh, well, it's too late anyway. It's time for everyone to move to high ground. <laughs> that, that's really pessimistic. Exactly. <laughs> well, I hope you will take that's us. That's why the uh, election is going to be a lot of fun. I hope you will take us through the channel on this and show us the way, show us how it evolves, because I think there'll be a lot more discussion between now and November. Um, Absolutely. Uh, I mean, November next year, and uh, and we, I right. look forward to exploring these issues with you <laughs> on an ongoing basis, Lou, because they really are, you know, a statement of our future. Anyway, Lou Pugliarisi, exactly. uh, the president of EPRING, the Energy Policy uh, Research uh, Foundation in Washington. We enjoy so much talking with you, get you, getting your perspective and seeing the thing on a national scale. Very important for Hawaii to understand that. Thank you so much, Lou. Thank you, Jay. Aloha. Aloha. Talk to you soon. <laughs> okay.